Today is 19 February 2019 and uh, it's the full moon day of uh, February, it's the last day of Chinese New Year. It's a, in Thailand it's a public holiday by the way because today it's called Maga Pucha. Of course it, you know it as uh, chapter man, eh? 15 day. Uh, it's a special day because the last day of Chinese New Year. It's a very significant Buddhist holiday too. In fact, from the word holiday, you get holiday. No? So, now, traditionally in Buddhism, there are three holy days. Okay? First day, of course, is the Buddha's birthday. Actually, it's the Buddha's birthday, enlightenment day, passing away day, it is all on the same day. Okay, so it's called Vesak Day, or we call it Buddha Day. And traditionally, in other words, the global Buddhist community, they decided to celebrate it on the full moon day of May. Okay? Of course, if you follow the Chinese calendar, then it, it changes a bit. So in Singapore, you find that, uh, the, the controlling Buddhists are the Chinese Buddhists, so we follow Chinese calendar here. So somewhere it's a little different from uh, the rest of the world basically, Southeast Asia, Sri Lanka and so on. Okay? But usually it is the full moon day of May. So that's Vesak day. No? And then there is what's called Dhamma day, Asalha Puja day. Now, all these are in your notes, you can go back and read. No? Asalha Puja, it's at the bottom of your page if you want to see very small print. Asalha Puja, Dhamma day. This is on the full moon day. <coughs> Uh, of June, July, okay, and that's the day when the Buddha gave the first teaching, the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta. Okay, now the, this day is significant. Dhamma Day, Asalha Puja Day, is significant because it marks the first teaching the Buddha gave, and also the start of the three months rains retreat for the monks. Okay, now the three months rains retreats are important. For the monks, it is their common birthday, yeah, so to speak. All those monks, they should spend time together. They stay in one place for three months of the rains. Because in India, that period is raining. Okay? So they stay in one place, and then they, they have a chance to talk to each other, get teachings from other teachers, and they also have a chance to meet the monks. Right? And when they complete the three months without any break, eh, then the, at the end of the rains retreat, they are one year older as a monk. Okay, so we call it wasa. Eh? Wasa means rain. Wasa also means monk's age. Okay? Now in Thailand, the, they use royal language. So the king's age also called wasa. Okay? And Thai to say pansa, okay. So if you meet a monk walking in the street, one of the first things you must ask the monk is, how many wasa are you? Right? If the monk says, I only two or three wasa, or less than five, then it's your duty to tell this monk, don't you think you should be under training with the teacher? You should not be wandering around. Definitely not in Singapore, not in a resort world, not in a shopping complex, right? Now we need lay people to tell this. And in the Buddha's time, the lay people always do their duty. Nowadays, lay people forget about their duty. They're afraid of the monks. They think the monks have magic and power. The monks are just like you, sometimes worse than you. Many of you here are much, much better than the monks. They, they just dress different, different hairstyle, but Sometimes you don't keep the rules, then they are not monks. But if you tell them, so we want good monks, then they are more, the thing about it, they say, wow, you know, these lay people know the rules. This is what happened in the Buddhist time, you know, that's why there's the Vinaya. The Vinaya means the monastic rules. Lay people complain. Then the Buddha introduced those rules to maintain the faith of the lay people. If the lay people have no faith, then the monks will go hungry, you know. 
But nowadays, monks and nuns are very clever. They say, oh, we are independent now, you know, we use money so we don't have to get support from the lay people. Then you are just like lay people. Okay? The whole idea of being a monk is you are totally dependent on the lay people for food so that you behave well, you practice well as monks and nuns. Lay people, so you work hard, you save money, and you support them. And, and you get drama from a ghost like that. That's the, that's the arrangement. Yeah? <coughs> And uh, the purpose of being a monk is to awaken in this life, to become an arahat in this life. If not possible, become at least stream winner, which is very easy for a monk. For lay people also can. Stream winning is the first stage of reaching the path. Yeah? So the Dharma Day is very important to remind us that not the Dharma is here. The Buddha has already risen in the world, the Dharma is present. Okay, so the rains retreat reminds the monk, you are now one year older as a monk. How close are you to Nirvana? <coughs> this is the teaching. Yeah? Yeah. And then of course you have the third holy day, that's today, Sangha day, which is the very special day because it's the first assembly of the early saints. Um, now, let me just read to you the. It's called the Four Limb Assembly. Okay, you can see four things there. These four things happen all at the same time. Number one, it is the full moon observance day of the month of Magga. Today is full moon day, it's a precept day. In other words, we will keep the precepts today. Some people will keep the eight precepts. Right? Depends up to you. Right? At least five precepts, of course. A precepts means you behave like a monk. Okay? You stay by yourself, study sutta or meditate, and you take food only uh, sunrise, between sunrise and, and noon, just one or two meals, and you kind of practice meditation. It's like a one day retreat. Okay? In fact, this was originally the meaning of holiday. Every week there's one holiday. People don't work, they go to the temple, practice meditation, listen to Dharma and so on. Right? But of course nowadays people are busy. After the Industrial Revolution, the calendar went havoc, everything changed normal, Sunday holidays. No? But you can choose any day to spend time with yourself. It is called solitary practice. Solitary practice. This can be done any time. It can be done any length of time. One hour, half a day, one day, also can. Okay. You can do this anywhere also. You do at home, you do in a quiet place. Usually it's a beautiful place. Right? So if you're happy, it's a time to be happy, to be peaceful, to remember you're a human being, you're not a cat, a dog. No matter how lucky a cat or dog is, it is still a cat, it's still a dog. You cannot learn Dharma. You, you can be a temple cat, you can be a temple dog. On the face, Facebook you see some cats and dogs and not to put their paws together. And say, wow, what a clever cat, clever dog. But it's still a cat, it's still a dog. You cannot attend Nirvana. You cannot even meditate. Right? So, of course you want to be compassionate with these animals. Then they have a chance to be reborn happy and then from there you become human. <clears throat> humans again, then they can meditate, they can control their mind, they can free their minds. Okay? So when we spend this quiet moment, we remind ourselves, this is wonderful, we are humans. That means we can control our mind, we can free our minds, we can meditate. We can even go beyond the devas, beyond the heavens. We can become free and awakened. Okay? So this is the full moon day, a day to remind us this is a holiday. So occasionally, as Singaporeans, we are we know we live in a house, city, buildings all around us. Occasionally, it's good to just go in the open. You know, I get up sometimes for between four and six in the morning. Every other day, I go for my exercise. Now, after doing for two three months, I can count. I use. 15 types of machines, and all this provided by the government, you know. <laughs> These machines are all there in the park, all kinds of machines for you to do exercise. And as soon as I got to lie down, you look up, I can see the moon. You see? 
So if you do that, I do in the morning, four, between 4 to 6, before 6, 6.30, you can see the moon if it's in the sky. And it's a very beautiful sight. You know, the full moon tonight, eh, you see, it brightens up everything. So the Buddha will give talks during such a night, you know, full moon. And if you are in the full moon, you see everything brighter, so your eyes will adjust. So these are, these are the old days when there's no electric lights like this, and no microphone, you know. So they can hear each other, of course the Buddha got a very loud, clear voice, right? The, the Indians are blessed with this voice, like the Chinese, they also, Chinese are also very noisy, you know. So, you know, when they talk, you can hear very clearly, you know, right? So imagine the Buddha is like that, very clear, right? So the full moon is a special day because it's very bright and people gather together in a beautiful park or garden and descend to the Buddha. And then number two, 1,250 monks assemble spontaneously, unprompted. In other words, there's no arrangement, there's no pre-arrangement. They just decided they want to see the Buddha. It's a full moon day, so why not see the Buddha? So the 1,250 monks. Now the, the problem is we don't know who exactly are these 1,250 monks. We know roughly, okay? So different scholars have different views. So two Japanese scholars came up with this idea. And at the end of the page that you will see, they calculate. Eh? So you can see the second page. Let, let me tell you the story first, how you get all these monks. You see, this, this celebration probably occurs within the first five years. I can't remember exactly, probably second or third, third uh, year of the Buddha's ministry. No? Uh, okay, first the, the Buddha got enlightened and then he gave the first sermon, remember? There are five monks there. And then after that, the, the Buddha, then the Buddha went to teach the three method hair ascetic brothers. They are fire worshippers, okay? Uh, there are three brothers and one, the younger one, youngest one lived, we say, Hile, you know? that means uh, down river. You know? And he has uh, 250, uh, I forget the exact number, I think 250 uh, followers. They all keep their hand and then they worship fire, okay? And then halfway up the river, second brother, he has like, you know, 500 disciples. And then up river, we said Ulu, eh? is the eldest brother, Kasapa. Okay? So he has got the biggest number of followers. So altogether they got like 1,000 followers. So the Buddha went to see the eldest brother, converted him, and then they all shaved their hair. And then all their fire worshipping utensils they put together, they put their hair in it, they float it on the river, and they went downstream. And then the second brother saw what's all this floating now, they got worried about their brother, they went up to see the brother, and they listened to the Buddha, they also got converted. And the youngest brother also same thing, came to see what happened to the two brothers. So the brother converted, I mean the Buddha converted the three brothers, the three Kasapa brothers, fire worshippers, and their one thousand disciples. So they already got one thousand already, no? But where did the other 250 come from? No? Right? Minus the five. Okay. So <clears throat> after that the Buddha uh, sent out no not yet. Uh, the, the Buddha went to teach uh, this young Yasa. No? Now Yasa has got fifty friends. So you if you calculate that you are you get more or less one thousand uh, 50, yeah? so another 200 more accounted for. So here is a list where Sariputra and Mughalana also is mentioned. Because in the case of Sariputra and Mughalana, they have 250 followers. Okay. Now the problem is actually, I, I think not mistaken, 250 each. You know? So you have another problem numbers there. But according to this uh, Mizuno and Nakamura, it says, well, you got the three Kasaba brothers, 1,000 followers. Of course, this, you round off the number because you got two plus three, right? three leaders, three teachers. Sariputta Mughalana got 250 plus two. 
So your total done up, you get 1,250. This is one uh, way of calculating. There is another way of calculating, which is in the same notes in this book. The, the, the title of the book, you can see at the top, Source Giga Naka Sutta M74 S16.1. So you got SD16.1. So you got to look for SD16.1. You go to section six, right? And uh, internet address is given to you there. So the notes are there. So this is only the basic idea. No? There are other details which are not important for today. So the point is, there are these 1,250, they are all arahats, not ordinary monks. They're just like the Buddha. They all decided to come and see the Buddha on this day without any appointment. Now, isn't it wonderful that's a New Year's Day? Eh? All your best friends just come like that at the same time. You'll be very happy, right? Okay, so the, that's the number three. Né? three the third coincidence. Né? And they're all arahats with the six super knowledges. These are first class arahats, highest level. What are the six knowledges, six powers that you can see? Not number three. Okay. Yeah, not number three, the six powers. So, number one, they all got psychic powers. Yeah, because they all go into deep meditation. They can reach the fourth jhana, so they have all these psychic powers. And you got the divine ear, that means they can listen. Anything they want far away, they can even listen to things the devas are talking about. They don't need telephones. Yeah? And then mind reading, yeah? they can just read your mind. It's very convenient. When you ask questions, they can understand you better. Yeah? And then retrocognition, that means they can recall past lives. They can look back, find out. Why is it useful to your past lives? Then you understand how you behave now and then what you can do. And why certain people like you, some people don't like you, because of past life connection. And then the divine eye, here they can see very far away. Okay? But all these are worldly knowledge, doesn't mean you're enlightened. So remember, anyone has got this power doesn't mean they're enlightened, that doesn't mean much. No? Number six is the real one. The knowledge of the destruction of the mental influxes. In other words, all the defilements, they overcome that and they become arahats. So these are called the six knowledges. Again, you want details, you look at the SD number there, and we'll give you some more details. So these are all the great arahats, 1,250 of them. Definitely the first five months and the Kasuba brothers and so on. In fact, they are so old, you don't hear much about them later in the suttas, you know. Because by the time they're very old, right? maybe they are living quietly in the forest doing solitary meditation. Right? Then the fourth coincidence is that they all have been personally ordained by the Buddha. They became monks through the Buddha himself. Why is this important? Well, basically there are two kinds of monks. No? During the first period, first period is roughly the first 10 years to first 25 years, okay, or 30 years roughly. During that time, there were no monks like today, see? They became monks by first listening to the Buddha, or they go to the Buddha, they ask questions. They ask all kinds of questions. And the Buddha will teach them just a bit only, so that they understand. And for example, you know, uh, the five monks, they listen to the first discourse, Dhammachaka Sutta, they all uh, got the first stage. You know? And then when they hear the second teaching on non-self, they all become arahats. Okay, just two teachings. You know? And then, uh, Sariputta, he hears, he sees a monk, right? I mean, he, he's, a, he's a young man, you know, he, he and Moggallana, two good friends. They, this, they, they were very rich kids from different families, best of friends. The family have known each other for seven generations. So they went to enjoy this 
Hilltop Festival. It's one of those uh, like fun fair, like basically. Yeah? And you see a lot of music, singing, dancing, and you know, Indians they like to use swings, you know. Yeah, that reminds me, even during my exercise, some of these people they exercise by sitting on a swing. <laughs> they swing every time. <laughs> so, the, even in this uh, hilltop festival, there are swings. And lots of those, like you see those Hindi songs in the Hindi movies, and they love singing, you know. So everybody was singing and very happy it's for young people, lots of lovers and so on. And these two young men went, to, went there you know, on this hilltop. And they say, they look around and then something strange happened to them. You know, sometimes you watch a movie, you have these stories and a lot of noise and suddenly the movie went silent, you know, and then something interesting is going to happen. So this young man, Sariputta Mughalana, suddenly they look at all these people enjoying themselves on the hilltop. They say, what's going on here? They say, these people, huh? look at them, what are they doing? Don't they know that after, within a hundred years, you know, at the most hundred years, they will all die? And what is, are they singing and dancing about? You know? Now this is called Sangwega. This is called the sense of urgency. They suddenly realize the meaning of life. They say, what's going on here? Don't these people know what's going to happen to them? Right, so they suddenly just, like the food, everything, no taste already. They lost interest in all this and they say, oh, this is no fun already. Right? So then they told each other, they say, you know, we, we may be best friends, huh? But best of friends also must part. Otherwise, you're going to suffer. You know? So, let us each go our way, look for a good teacher. And once we find a teacher, uh, they got a certain date. They say we'll meet again, you know, and then inform each other who's the teacher, and then they will go together. Uh. So, they're still good friends, and then they kind of uh, go to the same teacher. The first teacher they found was not very clever. But he's, he's called uh, Sanjay. Uh. Okay? He's called a skeptic. Uh. In other words, he doesn't know anything. Of course, in our modern times, skeptics are respected, you know. If you say you don't know, you say, wow, you're very wise. <laughs> because if you say you know, everybody will argue with you, you see. <laughs> to say you don't know, in a way, you got to prove that you don't know. That's quite tricky, you know. So imagine Sakicha was that, he's a skeptic. Isn't it? So Sariputta Bhugalana became his follower at first. Then one day, Sariputta saw the youngest of the five monks. His name is Asaji. Asaji, eh? So all this Asaji was doing was very calmly doing what monks do. Eh? He was going on his arms round. So Sariputta saw him and said, Wait, this is no ordinary monk. Eh? This is no ordinary person. He never seen a monk before. He said, This is no ordinary person. He's very peaceful. And uh, of course he knows there are these wanderers, they go collect food, you know. So he follows, so he respects these holy people. So he knows that he's not supposed to interrupt this Asaji going on arms round, so he just follow him, you know. He, he noticed Asaji is so peaceful walk. You know, these monks when they go on arms round, there are rules. They walk, they look down in front of the plow's length, yeah? 45 degrees down. They don't look around like tourists, they look down very peacefully. Of course, occasionally you got to look up to see there are people waiting for you or not. But always you look down mindfully and then you walk to collect arms. So he followed Asaji and then he saw Asaji collecting arms and then taking food. Of course, when Asaji is going to take food, he prepares the place, prepare water for him. You know, because he's going to ask questions. So when Asaji finished eating, then only he asked Asaji, he says, Who is your teacher? Uh, what kind of teaching do you follow? Can you please teach me? But Asaji is a new monk, you know, so he is, I mean, although he's an Arahat, we're not told exactly when he left, but probably he's already an Arahat. So he, he doesn't like talking very much. And moreover, he doesn't like talking to wanderers. He says, oh, these wanderers, they like to argue, and you know, they, they don't really want to learn. They ask you questions. There's a lot of debating going on in those days, you know. So he didn't want to get involved. Okay. So he said, no, I can't tell you anything, I'm, I'm very new, you know. But 
Sariputta was persistent. You know, this is a good teacher. You know? So he said, no, you must tell me, please. You've got, you've got to teach me. You know, this persistence is very important. You find this sort of story in the, in, in the suttas. Eh? Another very persistent uh, student, can you remember who? Someone called Bahia. Bahia. Bahia's story is very long, so I just cut short. He met the Buddha. So when he met the Buddha, again, he said, please teach me, he tells the Buddha. All right? But the Buddha is on arms round, you know. And this is, in other words, there's a time you don't ask for teachings, you know. But he had, he had walked a great distance, you know, to look for the Buddha. So he told the Buddha, uh, you've got to teach me. But the Buddha said, it's not the time. I'm collecting arms. He said, no, you, have, you must teach me. You know, because if you don't teach me, I might die suddenly, you know. The Buddha said, not the time. Then again, Bahaya says, please teach me. If you don't teach me, maybe you might die. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so he went on like that. So the Buddha said, well, this guy is persistent. Okay. So the Buddha like slowed down his lunch. You know? <laughs> I mean, the arms round, you know. In fact, the Buddha often teaches in the morning anyway. So the Buddha gave him a teaching. It's, it's a very famous teaching. It's called Bahia's teaching. One day I'll tell you what it is. Né? So he gave him this teaching, it's about the senses, né? to let go of the senses. But he understood. In fact, he understood so well, and it's not a monk, you know, he became an arahat on the spot. And as a layman, he was an arahat. But his karma is not good enough. He couldn't get his robes and bow, all those things right away, is it? So the Buddha said, have you got ropes and bowl? He said, no. He said, then, okay. So go and get your ropes and bowl. Go and find them and then you come back. You'll get ordained. So he went to look for his ropes and bowl. That is past karma ripened. An old enemy he had problem with. I'm not mistaken, it was a girl that he violated in the previous life. And this girl got very angry, cursed him. There are six of them in a city, but he's one of them. So this it's not good to curse people, eh? because you'll be reborn as an animal. So he's born either as a goat or a cow. There's two versions of the story. Anyway, both got horns, okay? <laughs> so this goat or cow saw <laughs> Bahia coming, and this is the child, so I just attacked him and got him to death. He died on the spot. But he died in Arahat. So, no rebirth, okay? And this is also the story, you know, where it is said that if a layman becomes an arahat, he has to get ordained on the same day, otherwise he will die, you <laughs> see? So this is one of the stories, right? Anyway, the point of this story is that it's persistence. When you, when you get a good teacher, ask questions. I did that, you know? My first teacher was a rotten teacher, but I came up, he was the best person I could find those days who can speak English, who, who's good in speaking, who knows some Dharma, otherwise he'd be dancing and he likes girls, things like that. So it's my karma anyway to have such a teacher, but I was asking him a question until one day he got so angry with me, he said, this Benson is mad, it's nothing but Dharma, Dharma, Dharma. <laughs> but when I heard that, I was so happy, I said, wow. You know? I said, I never thought. He thought so highly of me. <laughs> so that's our karma. So we get good teachers, we get bad teachers, but you got to ask for dharma. Eh? So that's what Bahia did. He asked for the dharma and he got enlightened on the spot. Sariputta asked for the dharma from Asaji. Ajaya said, no. Dharma, you can keep on asking. So Sariputta kept on asking. Then as I just say, okay, I will, I only know four lines, huh? and this is, I think, Brother Lowe's favorite line. Can you remember the verse? Huh? What was the verse? Page some page two. Huh? Okay, can you read to us? Is it Puja, is it? Puja book, is it? Of all the things that arise on a course, remember? First line? Yeah. And those things that arise on the course, <coughs> the Tathagata has told the course. Mm. <coughs> and also what does the station is, this is the doctrine of the great recruit. Right. So there are four lines, eh? First line? Yeah. 
uh, is it puja, the puja shape? No, it's in the oh, puja shape. Yeah, the, the, the folder case at the, the end. Puja shape. Yeah. This is a very famous verse. Sometimes they, they inscribe in stone and the, these stones are discovered in our region, you know. I don't know Singapore, you know, but definitely in Kedah, maybe Borneo, I think. The, the first line says something like, of all the things that have a cause, whatever arise in this world arise from causes and conditions. They are, they are cause that teacher or the Buddha has taught us and also the ending, how it ends. In other words, it's a teaching of how suffering arises, how suffering ends. This is the teaching of all the Buddhas. Four lines, no? Now, Sariputta hears only the first two lines. Become stream winner. Not Arahat, but stream winner. Because he has done a lot of goodies in the past. He meditated, he, he tried very best to keep his precepts. It's like us, you know, we try our best. The so, last line should be this. Uh, also, the great sage has declared. This is what the great sage has, has taught. Yeah, has declared. Yes, okay. Okay, so he just heard the first two lines, became a stream winner. Then he realized that, wow, that's not enough, you know. I must see the teacher, I must see the Buddha. But then he remembered his friend, Mughalana. So, anyway, his, his friend Mughalana is still in the ashram you know, with, with, the, uh, with Sanjaya. So, he went back there and told Mughalana the same four lines. Same thing with Mughalana, same karma. Here, first two lines become stream winner. Then both of them, they are, they, they are very respectful of the teacher. They said, no, we should tell our teacher, you know. But they told the teacher, nothing happened. The teacher is not very bright, unfortunately. Because the, this Sariputta said, you know, we are going to see the Buddha. Then Sanjaya said, well, if you are clever, go with the clever. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sariputta and Mughalana left, and then with each of them, the story went, 250 other wanderers also followed them, actually 500 you know, followed them. So they came to see the Buddha. And when the Buddha saw them, Buddha said at once, these are my two future disciples. The Buddha knew their karma is going to ripen, right? So there you are, there's another story about Sariputta who's very persistent to learn the karma. Nowadays, it's very easy to learn the Dharma. I started to learn my interest in Buddhism was when I was very young, about uh, 55 years ago. I can, I can tell you 55 because next year I'll be 70. So you minus 50. This year 70. Oh, this year 70, really? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> lost one year suddenly. <laughs> so, 50, uh, that means you minus that uh, when I was uh, roughly 15 years old, I came in contact with Buddhism. Okay? So since then, I've been very deeply interested in religion and, and, and Buddhism. So, uh, because I was from Malacca, we had all these religious places all over, you know. And as a teenager, we love food. And these temples and these holy places give free food. So me and my friend, we, we check their dates and calendars. When do we get free food? <laughs> and we'll go there. We go to the Indian temples, you know, during their fire walking ceremony. We can see them up close, running across the fire, you know. And then, the, then you get free food. All you got to do is sit down there, and you get free food. Well, that's lovely, you know. Then we found out when the Sikh temple gave free food, we got to cover our head piece of cloth and we had free food <laughs> and so on, you see. Unfortunately, we didn't go to the churches because we didn't give free food. You know? <laughs> so, um, I was very curious about religions. I was even curious about how all these different religions prayed. I went to different places and I noticed how they prayed. I remember going to the church and I saw there's this statue of a dead man. I said, oh, this is scary. I never went there again. And then I also went to the mosque, the oldest mosque in Southeast Asia, that is in Malacca. But I did not go in because I was told we're not allowed to go in, so I just sat outside and watched what they were doing. 
Then, of course, I came to Buddhism and uh, I found something which is meaningful. And then, of course, a long story cut short, I became a monk. The reason is because we couldn't find teachers. So many people wanted to learn Buddhism those days. We had no teachers. No one to speak in English to teach the Dharma. We, and then slowly we had visiting monks, you know. And many of them couldn't speak good English. So I said in the end, why don't, why don't I become a monk? <laughs> yeah. So I ended up as a monk. Then I started, of course, I studied uh, Buddhism in Thailand. You know, I had to learn Thai in order to study Buddhism because the, people, the English is not good. It was uh, very difficult for me to learn all those things. I had to learn Thai first and then only learn Pali. Can you imagine? I have to learn Pali through Thai, not English. But I discovered actually it's much easier to learn Pali through Thai because uh, many of the Thai words are Pali words. You know? <laughs> then I came back here and, then I, and, and you know I was like 20 years old 25. Then I found so many people here, they have so many kinds of Buddhism, you know. So I tried to make everybody happy, I tried to learn other kinds of Buddhism too, you know. Mahayana Buddhism, Vajrayana Buddhism, and so on, you know. So for a few years, I tried my best, I ran courses, I teach the Dharma as if all these kinds of Buddhism are connected, you see. But then as people are start asking me questions, I realized, wow, you know. It's not easy to answer all the questions without contradicting yourself. A simple question like, who is Kuan Yin? Does Kuan Yin exist? The moment you answer, you take a stand. See? If you say, yes, Kuan Yin exists, then you go against early Buddhism. If you say Kuan Yin doesn't exist, then you have another problem. I say, so I tell myself, wow, uh, I don't think I can go on like this, you know. You have to find what is the oldest Buddhism, what is the source, where does it come from, right? Because there's so many what I call prefix Buddhism, branded Buddhism, in Chinese Buddhism, Sinhalese Buddhism, Burmese Buddhism, <laughs> Thai Buddhism, Japanese Buddhism, <laughs> Nichiren Buddhism, wow, you know? So, these are all prefix Buddhism. Prefix Buddhism means the prefix is more important than Buddhism. That means they use Buddhism, they mess it up and say, this is my Buddhism. So I said, oh, you can keep it, you know. That's not what I want. So I told myself, what is the original Buddhism? So that took me some years, you know. It took me like half of my month's life you know, to decide. Towards the end of that, I said, wow, well, I think I should go back to early Buddhism, find out <coughs> the teaching. You know, people like to say, oh, early Buddhism is very simple, you know, but when you study the suttas, they're not that simple. I mean, yes, the language is simple, but the teachings are very profound. And I, I've been translating the Pali suttas, that is the oldest collection we have of the Buddhist teachings, for the last 17 years. Imagine, every three months, one volume like this, big volume like this comes out. Every three months, no? Right? If you are not happy doing this, is that if it's no fun doing this, you won't do it. People ask me, how, what keeps me going, translating, coming up with one volume every three months, about 180 to 200 pages of A4 suttas with notes, everything, you know. The simple answer is, it is fun. It is joyful, full of surprises. When I look back, I feel, I say, wow, it, it seems as if my whole life is preparing me to do this. Because I was in a science class, you know, those days if you're in the science class, well, you're very good, you know. You're supposed to be better than us class. Us class is not very bright, stupid, you know. <laughs> but then I told myself, I'm going to become a monk. I already, when I was before, uh, from five, I mean, in Malaysia is from five, from four, I think as early as uh, uh, sec three, you know, from three. I decided I want to be a monk. So by the time I reached from five, I told myself, I better do literature. So I told my form teacher, I said, he put me in a science class. I was put in a science class because of good results. So I said, I want to do literature. I don't want to do maths. I hate maths. 
<laughs> so I said, no, you can't. So he asked me to see the principal. The principal said, you can't. <laughs> I said, why? He said, because uh, you, you got good pass, you know. I said, if I have a good pass, why can't I choose my own class? <laughs> so again, persistence. Eh? So in the end, the headmaster scratching his head and said, what shall I do now? He said, okay, we'll put you in the art class, but your name is registered in the science class. And this is for the, the good name of the school. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, fine, no problem. So I was happy doing English. I want to focus on English and literature because I'm going to study suttas. And maybe, maybe translate suttas. Because there were no English suttas those days, you know, and not so easily available. So I was preparing myself very early. And uh, then I told myself, I have to go back to early Buddhism. That's how I came to do this work, okay? So there you are. You find uh, early Buddhism is very important because it brings you back to where the Buddha is, okay? No, I'm sorry, I've got So we come back to this uh, Maka Puja. <coughs> so you have this four wonderful coincidences. Né? So this full moon day, 1,250 monks came together to meet the Puja. <coughs> and they all are hearts. And they were all admitted by the Buddha by what is called the Kam O Monk. So those teachers, the, uh, those days, the Buddha would teach the monk. And then the, monk, the moment the monk understand, the Buddha would just say, Come, O monk. So they are already monks. By their own attainment. Then the Buddha just say, Come, O monk. The Buddha accepts as a monk. They are called Ehi Bhikkhu. Ehi means come. Right? So this first group of monks, they got, they became enlightened, they, they became awakened, they became arahats first. And then they become monks. Then later on, when there are 60 monks, all arahats, the Buddha sent them out to teach, and they brought back lots of con converts. And uh, imagine, say, after five years, ten years, the Buddha teach Dhamma, lots of Buddhism became very well known, the Buddha became very well known. So there are other people who also want to become monks and learn from the Buddhas, but they're not enlightened. And there are also those who are lazy and greedy. They see, wow, I see the Buddha is very successful, you know. All we need to do is join his club, you know, <laughs> become a monk and you get free food, easy life. It's the idea. The Buddha also accepts them. Imagine that. You know, Buddha could say, I don't need this guy is a liar, this guy is like that. You could have read their minds of what Buddha as, says, as long as you follow the rules, we accept you. Okay? So, how did the Buddha do that? He sanctioned the monks. He gave the monks certain uh, privileges, if you like, or power even. They can ordain the monks. Uh, this is where it becomes a legal act. So the Buddha was quite a lawyer too. You know? He taught the monks, when they gather together, in other words, there are five monks, at least you know, the, in the early times, and then you have one preceptor, like a president, who, who presides over the gathering, so there are six. You know? Then uh, they all properly ordained monks, good monks. You know? And then this candidate also has got all the good conditions, so you can become monks. So they became monks through being accepted by the Sangha. So in other words, what the Buddha has done, the Buddha has turned the Sangha into a legal person. And this legal person has powers to endow or to convey this state of being a monk to this person. So this is what made Buddhism last until our day, because the Buddha gave the monks the power to ordain other monks and also to preserve the teachings. And also lay people also attain the same things as the monks. There are some lay, good, very good lay teachers, you know. 
They are so good that even the monks went to them to, <laughs> to learn. Okay? So it doesn't mean only monks, uh, oh, of course, most of them are good teachers and monks, but they are also laymen who are teachers. Right? Because the Buddha put Dharma first. So all these arahats who came to see the Buddha, they already uh, awakened, enlightened already. So they don't need to know anything new. So what is the Buddha going There's no Vinaya because the monks don't need all these rules. The arahats will naturally keep to the rules. So the Buddha gave him a special teaching. The teaching is called the Admonitory Code. Admonitory Code. Owada Patimokka. You can see the word somewhere in the middle of the front page. First, second, third paragraph. Right? Admonitory Code. Or uh, the uh, admonition code, if you like. O Wada means advice, Patimoka, the monk's rules. And here is the first verse, very famous. Remember the number DH183. I always see this bus in Jurong East, 183. So when I see the number, I say, ah, this is the Dhammapada verse, 183. Okay? Sabba Papasa Akaranam Kusala Supas Sampada. So this is what the Buddha told them. Not doing anything bad. Cultivating the good or the wholesome. Purifying one's mind. This is the teaching of the Buddhas. Okay? This is the essence of Buddhism. The first line, not doing anything bad. Moral virtue, keeping the precepts. This is to say no. The five precepts, no to killing, no to stealing, no to social misconduct, no to lying, no to intoxication. The five no's. And then the second one, cultivating the good, are the five yes. Okay? Here, of course, basically it is to, why do you keep the precepts? So that your mind will be peaceful. You can meditate well. That's the second one. Uh, you attain deep calmness, then you understand suttas better, you're happier. When you're happier, you keep the precepts better. And these two combine the moral virtue precepts, meditation, peace of mind, combine like a pyramid. Uh, bottom is moral virtue and then meditation. With wisdom. Wisdom is a clear understanding of reality. You see directly into the true nature of things. It's the third line. Purifying your mind. Your mind is set free of all the ideas and views and defilements. This is what all the Buddhas teach. Same thing. Alright? So this is the most important verse to remember for today. Then the Buddha gave extra teaching to the Arahats. All this teaching actually boils down to just one word, you know, patience. Patience. There is one sutra, uh, this Lord Sakra and the uh, enemy, you know, the chief of the Asuras called Vipachiti. They decided not to fight each other <laughs> in a violent way or using arms. This time they used debate. <laughs> they said, okay, let's, we have what's called the Subhasita debate. Eh? The who can give the best teaching, right? So Webachiti said, uh, you got to control people. You know? If you don't control them, uh, then they will mess things up. Right? Teach them a lesson, things like that. You know? <laughs> Politicians fail, right? Then uh, Sakra said, no. You, know, you got to be patient with them. Right? In fact, Webachiti was captured, you know, he lost the battle. And he was scolding and using all kinds of terrible words against Sakra. Sakra just kept quiet, didn't do anything. And then Sakra's uh, assistant is the charioteer called Matali. Ma you know? And he's the one complaining. He tells Sakra, he says, why you let him scold you? He, he's already a prisoner, you know. He should not say such thing. You, know? you are the king of the devas, you know. Then the whole sutta beautifully talks about patience. Why it's better to be patient? Because if you are patient, you don't need to say anything. You already won the argument without arguing with this stupid person, this angry person. Right? So patience is the key virtue. You call a monk. 
And these are the words. Notice this song, Dhammapada. Eh? Dhammapada 183. I think 183 passes by here also, right? The bus. That's it. Mm-hmm. Eh? Yeah. Never mind. You go to Jirogis, you'll see what it is. Okay? Alright, next verse. Patience and forbearance are the supreme austerity. Now, you want to become strict, you become uh, like a forest monk, practice patience. Nirvana is supreme, say the Buddhas. Notice Buddhas, plural. Eh? Truly, one is not a renunciant who harms another. You are not a true monk if you hurt other people. Okay? No, is one a recluse who hurts another. Okay? Neither abusing nor injuring and restraint in the Patimokkha, the monastic code, and moderation in food. The Buddha is speaking to the monks. Eh? So moderation in food. Because the monks depend on, on their people and the monks don't need so much food because they meditate. Eh? And a remote bed and seat. Here remote. Uh, panta also means by yourself. Okay, this is a meditator, eh? so the monks will stay alone and meditate. But his, the, the idea of being a monk is to meditate. And devotion to the highest mind, that means a tenjana, peace of mind. So this is the aim of purpose of a monk. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Right? So for us, the people, the first verse is most important. The other two, second verse is applicable, third one is for the monks. Right? But you can adjust a bit. Simplified for lay people. So there you are. So you see, this is a very significant day today. And if you are traditional Chinese, you also know today is also the, the day. If you miss the first reunion dinner, today you also have another second reunion dinner. Okay. Now, why second reunion? Because in traditional societies, they work the whole year, no holiday, you know. Then they have two weeks holiday, that's Chinese New Year. And then today is the last day, they all spend time, they eat together because tomorrow they go back to work. Alright? So this is our second reunion together. Now for most of us, it's first reunion. Eh? And notice how all this is connected with Buddhism also. Okay? Alright, so I'll end here. Any quick questions? about Next lesson is next week. Ne? I'll talk to you about this. Uh, we'll use the book. Let's let SD 3.3 brackets 4.4 on page 57. Okay, this next next week. Ne? Okay, so if no questions, then we will close with a reflection. Okay? <coughs> Now this is a very special day today, your last day of Chinese New Year, a full moon day, a holy day. So just calm your mind for a while to remember all those people who have been kind to you, to remember your loved ones, your relatives, <coughs> to remember your good friends, and wish them all well and happy. We live in this world, we meet all kinds of people. No matter what kind of people we meet with, we have to make peace with them because we will meet them again in the future. You will meet them when you do good things with them. You also will meet them again in the future when you do bad things with them. But if you do bad things with them, you will continue to suffer in the future. So we would rather do good things, happy things, kind things with them, forgive them, accept them. So this is a special day to wish them all well and happy. And to remember that we should make that effort no matter what challenges we face, we can make that effort. And the Buddha is always there to guide us through his teachings. Reflecting in this way is very good karma. By the power of such good karma, may we be well and happy, may we be healthy, may we have clear minds, 
so that we are blessed with the courage and wisdom at least to aspire to stream winning in this life itself. And by the power of the three jewels too, may our loved ones be well and happy. All those people who have been kind to us to be well and happy. May they all see the true teaching in this life itself. May those who are practicing the Dharma in the right way to taste the fruit of the path in this life itself. And may those who are lost, practicing the wrong things, teaching the wrong things, to come to see the true teaching in this life itself. May all beings be well and happy. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.